My name is Michael Guyatt, publisher of The Lead Lag Report. Join me for the hour, roughly, is Mr. J.D. Henning, fellow Seeking Alpha contributor. Which I'm glad to see <laughs> that you're on that as well, J.D. Interest of the audience, and who are you? What's your background? What have you done throughout your career? And what are you doing currently? Hi, Michael. Thank you for inviting me on. This is great. My background, basically, I started trading when I was 19 with stocks and options and many years of different financial activities. You can see that on my bio, on my website and other things. But basically, I wanted to investigate anomalies. I've gotten into certified fraud examination, anti-money laundering, looking at anomalies. I went back and got my PhD in finance to look at research and anomalies just to find ways to beat the market. And most recently, I got on Seeking Alpha just testing my MDA analysis and laying out a, a historical record to show that timing really does matter and just seeing where it goes with the stock market. And so far, we've been beating it every year for the last uh, seven years. So uh, let's get into the anomaly uh, discussion for a bit. So I had a phase in my life where I would every week read you know, three to four different white papers on market anomalies going to SSRN.com and looking at different reference material and studying all kinds of different factors. Anomalies go through cycles, right? There are times when certain anomalies work really well because there's not much belief in them existing and times when everyone assumes the anomaly is there and then the anomaly gets arbitraged away, right? So there's always these kind of pendulum swings. Um, Absolutely. What anomalies have that you've looked at have were kind of really at the forefront of academic literature that in practice, maybe the last you know, several years haven't played out the way one might have thought. And what are some anomalies that are maybe popping up now? Yeah, that's a great question. A couple of them that I focused my dissertation on was was the price momentum anomaly that continues to persist no matter what people do. And, and we're seeing a little bit of that effect right now is that people love to chase prices and Prices go higher as they go higher. It's sort of a, a self-fulfilling momentum behavior. And another is the post-earning announcement drift. And, and there's a lot of analysis on it, you've probably read, where people are reacting to earnings and trying to figure out which way they're going to react. And that analysis is useful, but it comes out pretty much quarterly. And there are anomalies. You know, I've gone through hundreds and hundreds of anomalies and uh, detailed some of them in my literature. But what you find is that it ranges from the, the weather conditions in New York City to the star formations, to NFL football, to bubbles in the market, all kinds of things. And I found that the two prominent anomalies were definitely the price momentum and the, and the PED, the post-earning announcement drift. And what I did was I capitalized on those anomalies using something called the MDA analysis. And I have a lot of research going back on that. But the timing is really key to look at the equity momentum movements and how those stocks behave. So one of the things I saw was in your award-winning article about TRRS. And I think you see right away that timing really matters. And so I, I would say if you highlight some of those timing indicators, you use treasuries. And I wonder what you think of what the market is doing right now is it's starting to peak. Yeah, and it is right. So there's, I think this is a, a good nuanced discussion. There's research on anomalies and then there's how do you execute on the anomaly, right? So in my case, so all of those research papers, they document the same anomaly in different ways that there are leading indicators to conditions favoring higher or lower stock market volatility. So in my world, you know, from a risk on risk off perspective, it's less about trend, it's more about price gyrations widening or narrowing. In that paper you referenced, the finding is that on a month-over-month -month basis, when long-duration treasury is outperforming intermediate, basically if you use ETFs like TLT or versus IEF on a total return basis, the next month tends to be more volatile on average for equities, right? That it's a risk-off signal from that standpoint. That doesn't necessarily mean the stocks go down, right? It just means that volatility sure. is likely to increase. That, that, by the way, is a nuance I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate about the research and the connection between volatility uh, and trend. But, you know, for whatever it's worth, you know, the, the movement long duration treasuries versus intermediate, you know, is a risk off signal. That doesn't mean that you have to have a correction in January. It just means the conditions favor heightened volatility. Now you combine that with 
other relationships to confirm like utilities, like lumber to gold. Okay, that gets you closer to a higher risk period. But the point that I want to bring back to you is you have an anomaly. The question is, how do you take advantage of it? The way to play volatility historically is actually through treasuries themselves, right? Meaning as equities get volatile, typically you see that flight to safety in treasuries. You haven't seen that in the last two years. So the signal could have been right about volatility being higher or lower on a go-forward basis for equities. But if you executed that with treasuries, right? So take that to your own portfolios. So you, you identify these different anomalies. How do you go about even executing? Because if you're going to execute on a very particular opportunity set with that anomaly you've identified, you still need to have the cycle favor the opportunity set. Oh, absolutely. And what I do is I use the momentum gauge signals that evaluate 7,500 stocks in the equity markets. It's sort of a tipping signal of when they're in breakout con- conditions versus breakdown conditions. And what I can find is that, um, it, it, and again, this alludes a little bit to your paper, is it's one thing to have a good portfolio, but it's the timing factors that make a big difference. Because even today, this is a really significant moment. We're, we're approaching the exact same levels in the S&P 500 that we were at ex- almost exactly two years ago. And so if people aren't using a timing mechanism, and you hear a lot of people talk about, oh, you know, I'm just a buy and hold guy. I'm going to, you know, I, I don't care what the market does. I'm going to just check my portfolio in a couple of years and see how much I made. Those people are coming around to 0% gains for the last two years. You know, by comparison, you know, my MDA breakouts are up 249% this year and did pretty well last year with 142%. And then I have value st- portfolios like the Piotrowski Graham value. And I leverage really good literature in the financial journals. And this year, the value portfolio, which is a buy and hold, is up 48.7%. And a lot of people will look at that number and say, well, hey, that's fantastic. I I just want that result. But if you look at the historical movement this year, it had a drawdown of nearly 50% in the middle of the year. So when we hit the peaks in July, it was back up around 44%. And then it fell down, cut in half to October. And it was down around 20% 20 gains for the year at that point. And so... I tell people, you know, these are great stocks. You can build great portfolios, but timing really matters. And the way I leverage it, and it's similar to, you know, I do use the high yield government, the high yield corporate bonds. That's a very good indicator. But I use the MDA approach, which is the multiple discriminant analysis approach, which was to find variables that could predict breakouts and breakdowns. And then I put them into a ratio of positive versus negative. And I kind of use that as, for lack of a better word, just an ADX line of when the market's advancing or declining. And it gives us sort of a tipping signal of when it's going over. And, you know, you put it in your research, it's ideal if you can come up with a timing sim- signal that goes to a, a daily frequency. And my model is daily, it's weekly. I do have intraday signals, but as you know, you get the, the more detail you get, the, the more noise you get. And so I have a combination of these momentum gauges. And what it's enabled me to do is essentially show what you published in your paper, that it's one thing to have really good portfolios, but it's another thing to time them. So you could even take, I have these growth and dividend mega cap portfolios. And, you know, those are fairly boring stocks. But if you time them, you can really enhance your returns and, you know, get the high dividends that people are looking for. And so, you know, kind of in a nutshell, that's the model. It's applying this momentum gauge to a lot of different portfolios and trading ideas. And it captures, it, for the most part, it captures anomalies. Most people are trading either based on the variable of price or they're trading on the variable of earnings. And since earnings only come out quarterly, they basically have to just kind of ride that fundamental analysis for a few months and hope nothing drastic happens. And if they're going with price, You know, that's a variable that I like to try and predict. And I, when I go to try and do forecasting or prediction, I really don't want to use the same variable I'm trying to predict as the predicting variable. And so I approached my modeling by looking at now over 75 different variables that are not price change to try and forecast what the price might do in the short term to long term. And intuitively, you know, if you, as you're forecasting longer term, you want to rely on more longer-term indicators like earnings and fundamentals. 
And as you're going shorter term, you want to look at things like money flows and some of the technical variables that I use that I don't want to get into too much detail on. But essentially, there are indicators that show that these funds and fund managers are loading up. And I just like to be a fast follower and catch the rides. Is it fair to say that the academic literature around momentum and anomalies that help, you know, provide a chance to beat buy and hold, that those are primarily U.S. centric? I've always had this sort of intellectual debate about whether an anomaly is an anomaly if it doesn't persist globally. If it's just something that an observable dynamic in the U.S., is it more just random or is it because of the unique structure of the United States market versus other markets? How do you think through sort of the idea of that an anomaly should, if it's real anomaly, right, should really kind of be a global phenomenon? Yeah, that's a great question. One thing I would consider is that the U.S. market is highly liquid relative to a lot of other global markets. And so in, in one sense, if you see a, an anomaly related to liquidity, it may be even more pronounced in a foreign market. You know, we hold similar views about the efficient market hypothesis, and I, I find that there are a lot of flaws and there's a lot of lag in this so-called efficiency. And we can capitalize on that lack of efficiency. And going back to the foreign markets, they don't have as much volume or efficiency, so to speak, compared relative to the U.S. markets. And that's generally speaking. I mean, different segments have even less liquidity in the U.S. market than other places. But, but as a general statement, where you have a lack of liquidity, you have a lack of efficiency. And that's where you also have a chance for greater anomalies. And so there are many times, you know, even recently with this breakout stock GCT that I recommended to my subscribers and talked about on the webinar, it, it was a, a, a perfect example of very strong fundamentals, a really good earning story, but it took a while. There was a lag before it, it started to get closer to its efficient pricing levels. And I think that's common throughout the markets where if, if you're not focused just on price change and you're looking at the variables that set up for good gains to find efficient values, you're going to find it, you're going to find a lot of opportunities using non-price variables. And that's especially true. You know, I haven't done trading in the foreign markets, but that would be especially true with very inefficient foreign markets where the lag to find the efficient pricing could be weeks or a month and it gives you a really good opportunity for gains. So that's how I would approach the anomaly, you know, strategy with dealing with foreign markets. But I certainly don't, I'm not a strong proponent of efficient market theory. I've seen time and time again that there's so many anomalies, there's so many bubbles. I was just reading today that the SPACs have essentially collapsed with, I think, 21 of them going bankrupt for $46 billion in loss. Uh, and a lot of that was just bubble and hope and, and the idea that it could be something big, but it, it just didn't materialize. And we see that constantly in our markets, you know, trying to determine what's real, what's not, what has legs, what doesn't. And that's kind of how I approach the anomaly side of things. You mentioned the, the background of forensic side of things and how you have a portfolio, I think, that's focused on that way of analyzing. And that really relates to zombie companies and, you know, the idea that certain companies will be ongoing concerns versus not. Talk through that a bit as a process. I think that's, at the core, that's really as deep fundamental analysis as you can get, right? Because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, what you're trying to identify is the likelihood of a company surviving and if the market has mispriced that, that probability. That's right. Yeah, that's a fun area that I like to study. The term zombie companies actually came from the Fed. They were trying to figure out what companies they should give stimulus money to that they wouldn't go to waste. And I guess they commissioned a team and, and published some, some papers on it. And I've since updated you know, some stock screens based on their standards and put them out there. What I find is you know, people say, well, you know, either my company's not a zombie company, you're misvaluing it, they have huge potential and all this. The idea is this is just core value analysis. This is as fundamental as you get. And it's using a lot of different forensic algorithms and, and various things that as long as the data is accurate, you know, you're going to get a, an accurate outcome. And, and it's basically saying these companies don't have the organic growth potential or currently are thriving only off of borrowing money to be a going concern. So they have a higher risk. And some of those that 
that fit that bill in years past have been GameStop and AMC and others that have been high flyers. And I would say, if we go back to the GameStop story, people would say, well, why would you buy a zombie company? But if, as we remember, and, and you may have seen in the recent movie, Dumb Money, people were ch- gladly chasing 850% returns in a week or 500% in a day. And it was to the point, I have a, a chart that I post that shows that the uh, S&P was declining as GameStop was going up because people were selling fundamentally good S&P 500 stocks just to buy more GameStop. And you can see this perfect inverse correlation for that week of really high gains where people were just chasing, you know, the opportunity for the for these large gains in a zombie company. And it, it gets back to the fact that, you know, people are, the, the number one variable that most investors use or just can't get away from is price change. So when they see th- something going up, whether it des- deserves to go up or not, there's just such a temptation. It's just a strong human factor of FOMO that they got to get in. They got to put something in it to see where it goes. And so that's why I don't rule out zombie companies and I include them in the portfolio list. In fact, I had a portfolio in 2018 for zombies that did nine, made 94.29%. And that had a lot to do with the stimulus that was being pushed into the markets, as well as for 2020, that portfolio made 56% returns. And so w- when that stimulus is coming and everything's flying and, you know, they say, you know, turkeys can fly in a hurricane. It's don't pass up the opportunity for large gains when the stimulus is high and the Fed is just adding more money, that more liquidity. It's a good time to buy. You know, conversely, you don't want to be in zombie companies when the Fed is tightening or liquidity is drying up. So I, I continue to monitor a wide spectrum of funds and build portfolios that can fit just about any market. But it's important to understand why they do well and in what environment you can thrive in. So let's bring that to the name of the space, the 2024 investing playbook. It sounds to me like you think they're going to be, I think, cycle shift or regime shift, which I happen to agree with, that there could be some interesting opportunities. I always go back to, you know, the standout sector in 2022 was energy, largely sucked this year. Mm -hmm. Standout sector this year has been tech. I'd venture to say it's probably going to suck next year. Just, you know, outsized winners tend to not be outsized winners the following year. Where are we in terms of what you think the might next potential major sector winner could be? Yes, I agree with you on that. In fact, there's evidence to show that it's very rare for a, a, seg- a segment to, to be a winner two years in a row. Clearly, bonds have been brutalized and they have a long way to come back. I think that's a good place to put some money. And on the stock side, there's just a lot of oversold sectors. We're seeing biotech starting to race off the bottom, doing just incredibly well in the last couple of months. Financials have been oversold and they have a lot of opportunity to go higher, but they also have a lot of risk on their balance sheets. And a lot of it is dependent on the reserves from their treasury bonds that they're holding. So as long as treasuries keep improving, I think banks are, should be okay. It's a little bit riskier approach. What stands out to me in a lot of my growth and and dividend portfolios that are heavily based on the Piotrowski value model is that energy keeps popping up, you know, from Chevron to ExxonMobil to a lot of these major players in the energy sector. They're not getting a lot of love this year, but they definitely are making a lot of profits. And I think value investors are going to come back around and start snatching those up. One thing that does concern me is, you may have seen my article on Warren Buffett recently, moving to the highest levels of cash that he's ever held, I think it's $158 billion. And he's, you know, not a, a market timer, but when he doesn't see value, that's, that's essentially a form of market timing. And I think he's going to be waiting for a good sector rotation and a value play probably in some of these oversold sectors. Definitely tech is extended. I I know AI has tremendous potential, but what usually happens is that people pull forward that potential and they try and price it in way too early in the process. And we've seen that in a lot of short-term bubbles where there definitely is some value there. And without a doubt, AI is going to be transformational. 
but I wouldn't put all of it right up front and and price it all in. Some of these stocks are are quite high. And one of the things that I run into with, excuse me, with analyst pricing is things like NVIDIA. You know, I, a few years ago, I, there were analysts saying, you know, buy NVIDIA, it's going to go to $500 and you're going to make a ton of money. And, you know, they're correct. But along that way, you know, last year, NVIDIA lost 66% of its value from the peak. And so, you know, you have to ride through some of these turns if you're not doing some kind of timing mechanism. And so those analysts may be correct, but a lot of times they won't disclose the drawdowns that they took their investors through. And so what I like to do is minimize the drawdowns with the momentum gauge timing signals. And, you know, in the long run, you can beat a lot of returns in a lot of different kinds of portfolio types. So for that's what I anticipate for next year really is more value plays, a little bit of thinning out, maybe just consolidation of the technology sector. But all my indicators are extremely high positive. The weekly momentum gauges haven't been this high since February of 2021. And that was at the peak of the COVID Fed stimulus. And we're not seeing those kind of stimulus activities in the markets. In fact, we're supposed to be seeing quantitative tightening. And so it's a little bit surprising that investors have found so much momentum in this last part of the year just on a Fed rate pause, because historically, it's not the hiking cycle that, that leads to a crash. It's always been when the Fed held higher for longer, and the higher for longer ended up being too long for the market's tolerance. And so I think really the riskier scenario is if the Fed stays elevated at these interest rates, we could really see it a problem. And naturally, that would convey to a lot of stocks that are heavy in debt or classified in the zombie category. That point about February 2021 is interesting because that's when small caps started going sideways. It's also a week or two after the GameStop media, right, as far as that, that spike happened. It's when Brett started weakening. And if you remember in 2021, small caps were going through this very volatile sideways pattern, not unlike what we saw this year. Yep. And then you had like a false breakout, right? And then that was it. It was game over afterwards. Right? That's and right. That's break. right. So I, I do wonder if there's, I do wonder if everyone's getting fooled. I, I've used that term. It's a trap. And obviously I've been wrong so far. But I do wonder if for all the exception on bull caps, which I think they're going to probably outperform large caps, doesn't mean on an absolute basis, just means relative. I just wonder if there's a similarity there to, you know, it looks like a breakout from a long sideways consolidation, but then it gets projected again. Yeah, I think you're really onto something. The 2021 sticks out in my mind because we had such violent sector rotation. So the, the indexes were, were kind of, like you said, moving sideways in consolidation. But under the surface, you know, there were days where, you know, different sectors were dropping five, six, seven percent and then rallying, you know, the next week. And it was just this relentless churn across sectors, as people were saying, trying to figure out where the traction was going to be found. And I just kind of remembered a little bit of exhaustion and fatigue with, with the members and, and traders in my service, because we were just watching, you know, the index is moving sideways, but a lot of violent moves to find action uh, across the sectors. So, and that typically, you know, when people can't get the traction or they can't get the consistent gains, it does lead to a sell-off. It just says, I'm taking my money, I'm going home for a while. And that could be the, the scenario for the you know, early part of 2024. But I do think it's going to, people are going to start looking more and more towards value, especially as liquidity tightens. You know, there's concerns about the CRE loans and whether banks can sustain with all the refinancing that's coming at higher rates, you know, and that's going to be some big vulnerabilities for high debt companies. And it makes it more attractive to find the value. It's probably more attractive to find bonds at these higher yields. And it's probably a lot to do with why Buffett is kind of sitting on the sidelines right now, you know, look, looking for the next dip buying opportunity. I don't know how it's going to unfold in terms of a, a decline, but I, I think I'm sitting in the nosebleed section of, of the market momentum gauges. And a little concerned about 
how bumpy the ride down could be. Just to breathe head the room for the remaining 20 minutes, everybody, please make sure you follow JD here on X. If anybody want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom left mic request button. And as always, this will be podcast under Lead Lag Live. Let's talk about managing risks when you've got different portfolios focused on different types of anomalies. I always go back to the idea that diversification is more than just what asset classes you hold. It's also what strategies you follow, right? So it sounds to me like you've got these different portfolios focused on different factors, different anomalies. That's your inherent diversification. But there are going to be times when uh, it seems like everything is maybe desynced for a period of time. How do you determine where to overweight a particular allocation to based on those various portfolios, various anomalies? There are times when anomalies are really out of favor and you really want to actually go all in on that, right? And times when yeah. something's really running and it's like, well, if the anomaly has momentum, maybe you want to ride that. Yeah, those are really good questions to get to the core of trading and timing. Currently, you know, one of the, I guess you can call it anomalies, is that the PBOC, the Chinese bank, is loading up to stimulate their markets again. And it's been the largest stimulus in the past week, I think, for a lot, more than in the last two years. And I tend to get in a little too early sometimes, but we're seeing yen, the 3x China bull fund, break out today. And it's been trending higher, slightly higher. But I think that has room to run as long as the central bank keeps stimulating. We see that with our own Fed, that it can really make the markets behave in certain directions. So that's an opportunity. I've added more to the Chinese side of the stocks for now. But in terms of determining what asset classes and what to focus on, I really rely on the MDA momentum gauges. And I have them broken down by sectors. So I know which sectors are strong, which ones are weakening which ones look overbought, and and that guides a lot of my decision-making process. Related to that, I also have active ETF bull bear funds trading that I do. So when we got a negative signal in, in February 2020, right before the COVID correction, I was able to load up on bear funds, and we made substantial gains in, on the decline. So So these signals give me a tipping indicator that tends to lead the market. Related to that, we saw in my financial sector gauges, they were showing in late February that the market was dropping, where the gauges were dropping sharply for the financial markets. And then within a week or two, we saw that the the financial sector was starting to collapse. And we had Silicon Valley Bank and others that, you know, either collapsed or had to be acquired. And so, and that was during a time when the tech sector was doing just fine. And I think, you know, if this correlates to the choppiness that we saw in 2021, I think that following the sector gauges in 2024 is going to be a really guiding, strong guiding factor for me. Talk about how you even go about trying to identify new anomalies, new things to focus on. You know, obviously it sounds like you've done well with the way they structured the portfolios in the past, but I would go back to again, their cycle in factors in anomalies. Are you constantly sort of doing back testing or researching different and new white papers? I'm sure you've seen the studies that show, for example, that, you know, when a white paper is out, suddenly the anomaly that it's showing largely gets arbitraged away for the following several years. So you see like there's this constant chase, right, to try to find the next thing that that might be working. But um, how do you just go about identifying new things to maybe focus on? Well, it really is when things go to an extreme. They catch my attention and then I sort of investigate it and see you know, what the probabilities are for profit taking or a position for for large profits. One of those was natural gas a couple of years ago when it started to spike. We knew it had to come back down to regular levels and and made quite a large gain in cold, the minus 2x bear fund and part of the bull fund on the way up, which is boil. You know, I look for those extremities that and outliers that really give me an indicator of something's not right here. And I would say, generally speaking, the market is in, a, in an outlier condition. So I look under the hood and I see, well, which sectors are stronger? Which things are, are looking like a complete anomaly? And throughout the year, there's cyclical anomalies, like the Russell rebalancing anomaly that I tracked for years and saw that there are different, definitely strong anomalies on which stocks to buy from the Russell rebalancing that can give you outside returns, outsized returns. That not to get into you know the minutiae of the study, but 
the, the short answer for that anomaly is that stocks that are being elevated into the large cap segment of the Russell indexes greatly outperform stocks that are being pushed lower into the Russell 2000. So, you know, that's something for your listeners to consider. There are just so many anomalies out there that are fun to investigate. Uh, a lot of times, members of my service will bring them to my attention. I like to do forensic analysis on stocks where somebody says, you know, is this one being manipulated? Does this look bad? What's going on here? And we kind of do a muddy waters thing and we take a look under the hood and see, yeah, there's some major red flags. I wouldn't touch this. And, you know, it's a little bit different than your standard fundamental analysis, but you can see that there, there are manipulations in the market. Not all of those manipulations result in bad returns. In fact, you know, Ed, Enron was shown to be a manipulator for about nine consecutive years on the Benish M score, which is a forensic model. And, you know, Enron did phenomenally well uh, until, you know, all the whistleblowers came forward. So it's one of those double edged swords, you know, just because something's classified as zombie or, you know, a forensic red flag, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't make, you know, some crazy returns until the bubble pops. And so you have to, as an investor, you have to decide, do you want to dabble in those kind of anomalies, you know, for the, the GameStop chasers, or do you want to just sit on the sidelines and kind of avoid the stress? And, but I, I definitely like looking at irregularities in the market and opportunities that, you know, that can be arbitraged away, but not necessarily are arbitraged away. Do you think that indexation the tremendous move towards passive, you know, the kind of automatic flows into market cap weighted averages when it comes to 401 keys, that it, it results in this kind of strange dynamic where there are more anomalies because more money is going towards passive, but also more anomalies you can't necessarily fully take advantage of because you still need active money to, to make the anomalies worth something, right? I'm trying mm -hmm. to get to this sort of conundrum, I think, that active managers have, which is that, yes, they're all, all the theory and all the you know, data would suggest that there are more opportunities to get, generate outsized risk-adjusted returns because so much money has just gone into passive, blind investing. But by the same token, there aren't that many true active managers left to even take advantage of the anomalies because they've gotten their ass handed to them for the last decade. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question in terms of how do you value, you know, what stocks are, are worth getting into and which aren't. And I think this is what's been crushing a lot of hedge funds that are trying to do it based on purely on value and fundamentals is when you have this herding effect into these passive index funds, you, you end up with fund managers that are sitting on tons of cash and they have to load up that money into the same big popular stocks again. And, you know, they may have to hold their nose and just buy it regardless of, you know, 400 PE ratios and you know, crazy earnings valuations. And, the, you know, they're not even looking at, at the values and the fundamentals, but they're doing what the clients and what the fund is, is set up to do. And they're just going to keep plowing that money into the most popular, most overpriced stocks in the market. And it does create that price momentum anomaly effect. And, but at the same time, you know, you don't have to go back very far to, to 2022 when Facebook, but back then before it was Meta, had an enormous drop and the herding was out. You know, they lost billions in one day. And I think those herding effects can happen very quickly. You know, the money flow can come in strong and steady, but the exit door is fairly small. And when a lot of money wants to exit these gigantic mega caps in a hurry, there's not a lot of buyers to pick it up. So there's inherently a lot more risk and an opportunity for a, a huge anomaly there to protect, you know, to capitalize on these, on the gains that come from overpricing these stocks from the ETF funds. The active investors may get, you know, their ass handed to them in, in some regards, but there are also a, a lot of opportunities outside of the mega caps that are doing tremendously well at some better valuations. And I like to focus on a lot of those stocks. You know, that's maybe a gap in my models is I don't, load up so much on the FANG stocks. But I do find that there's very strong opportunities, whether it's small, mid-cap, you know, growth and dividend, even many of the large caps that can really outperform long-term. And I would also argue that passive investing and passive indices are not really all that passive. 
You know, they rebalance every year. They reconstitute, you know, at least every year. And they're changing and as active as some of the other funds that are out there. So it, it does give you an illusion that it's passive or that it's an index, but there's a lot of trading going on these indexes. Talk about maybe some of the newer positions that you put on uh, across the different portfolios or maybe certain plays you're particularly excited about to the extent you're comfortable. Yeah, sure. Well, it's coming to the year end and I'm going to restart a lot of portfolios with new picks for the going out this weekend. But, you know, some of my current holdings, I could probably get into a little bit of a discussion on that. One of the picks this week was Allo, A-L-L-O. It was very, it's a very strong breakout stock with a short squeeze potential on it with a 30% short float. What I like about it is it has very high vested shareholders with institutions and with insiders holding very large positions. I'm not sure why they're shorting it with such a strong fundamental earnings result recently. And so it has a lot of good upside potential. My, my investors this week, members have made, I guess it's up 16% through Thursday morning. And that's a strong stock. Others I've highlighted are still going strong. It's CLSK, GCT, and oh, one that starting to really move is COD. It was a pick a couple of weeks ago. It's KOD and it's starting to fill a gap on a technical basis looking at the chart with and under good accumulation. So those are some of the short-term high volatility gaining kind of stocks. More on the large cap value stocks, I picked Caterpillar several weeks in a row for the Dow picks and and Cat has been going strong as a value pick and and a Dow pick. It's up over 15% from the last selection. So there's a whole variety of them. I know members of my service are very interested in looking at my new Piotrowski Graham value picks for next year. Our top pick this year was Sky West, SKYW, and that gained over 220%. There's other good ones. Allied Bank is one of the strong ones on that list for last year that may continue to next year. And so, you know, those are a handful of pretty good value stocks that could go very well into next year. I have a bias towards energy. I just think oil and gas could do extremely well, regardless of what the prices are, are holding. They're, they've been able to re reap a lot of profits that they can reinvest in a lot of different ways. Um, and right now, they're, a lot of them are trading at or below you know, times earnings, which is quite unusual when there's high flyers out there that are getting all the money at two or 300% earnings. Didi, as we uh, wrap up, where do people find more of your thoughts, more of your work? And, you know, for those who want to think about investing more like you along the lines of trying to identify where there are certain factors or anomalies, what will be your biggest piece of advice? Yeah, you can find me on uh, vmbreakouts.com. I'm on Seeking Alpha under J.D. Henning. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me through links on your Twitter feed. And uh, I'm basically out there if you just Google J.D. Henning. You can get access to my services, my momentum gauges, and a variety of my stock picks. And on the point, I've started becoming more like you in terms of mindset around trying to identify facts and zombies. What, it does it require a certain type of personality, mental shift. It's not easy for people to you know, go beyond just you know, price alone in a chart. Well, definitely what you're saying in your paper that you know, listeners should definitely read, markets are dynamic portfolios change. You really can't camp in one model forever. And you definitely need to have signals if, unless you want to just hold the S&P 500 for two years for, you know, 0% returns. It's a dynamic market out there. And I try and highlight which, are, which areas are strong. I try and avoid the worst areas. And having a dynamic trading model will definitely improve your results. I know a lot of people are pushing the buy and hold approach, but that has very strong inherent risks, and uh, it's really good to, to use some methodology, you know, whether it's the treasury bills and the yields on the curves and different analysis, you really need to apply something in your timing to get the best outcomes. Then, of course, looking at the different types of portfolios, that is really determined on investors' risk tolerance and their long-term goals. And so I, I lay out a spectrum of different portfolios that people can choose from. 
And I hope they, you know, benefit and can build their own optimal portfolios. It's not that hard, but it's important to, to understand that markets are dynamic. And if you want to turn into a buy and hold investor, the markets can punish you for it. And so I've learned over the years to use some form of timing and it, you can really protect your downside. Everybody, please make sure you follow J.D. Henning here on X. Thank you, J.D. Really do appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Cheers, everybody.